Hi everyone, it's me Arden Lee and today I want to talk a little bit about some potential red flags for musical artists to avoid when navigating the music industry. Something happened to me fairly recently on the business side um, that was a little weird and caused some, some discomfort for a little while and I ended up navigating it and I was really um, I was really grateful for my community and I was really grateful for my resources and my intuition um, sort of guiding me on on what to do. Um, but I was still kind of a little confused about what had happened. So I went and I went and I went and I made this really long post on Facebook and it was a filtered post because I just wanted to get the, the, the opinions of my community. Um, and I basically said, hey, here's everything that happened. <laughs> like, here's a play by play of, of what went down. Like, was this gaslighting? Was this like, what was, what was, what was going on, man? Like, like this is, this just strikes me as being very weird. Um, and a whole bunch of people from the music community, um, fellow artists, fellow musicians who are more experienced than me, um, who have been in the industry longer, who have you know either worked with labels or worked with bigger producers than I have, basically came on and read. I was really like so grateful um, that they read this whole long post, um, and a bunch of folks commented and were like, "Yeah, this is seriously messed up," and and good on you for navigating this and and trusting your instincts and your intuition that like maybe something was a little off, and and sourcing the help you needed to um, you know to resolve this as as smoothly as possible. And, um, and that was, that was, I was really grateful for that. That felt really validating. And one of the people who ended up commenting on that post was someone I had not been familiar with before. We were friends on Facebook, but we hadn't chatted yet. And I was so grateful for the comment he left because it was so like heartfelt and detailed and passionate and really like really you know, explaining his perspective on the industry and some of the things that he's seen and some of the ways that my experience lined up with some of the patterns that he has seen happen in the music industry. His name is Alex Nasla, and we ended up having a really great conversation on Zoom uh, where he was generous enough to share with me a little bit more of his experience and what he thinks might have been going on. Like you said, you've seen this happen before, basically. Oh, many times and worse. Because yeah. this industry, if, if somebody feels like they can screw you, uh, it, it seems like more often than not, they will. <laughs> So I wanted to go ahead and share that conversation between me and Alex since I recently committed to uh, shedding light on some of the unsustainable patterns within the music industry and this feels like this feels like a very clear example um, of that. And um, for those of you who don't know Alex, Alex is of a band called Witherfall and he's also the producer and manager for a band called Helion Prime. And he is also the founder and co-owner of Spectre Digital, which is a company that makes courses and software in music production, in music lessons. They're also gonna be making courses coming up about this very issue of like navigating the music business and like how to make smart decisions and how to manage your career as an artist. So I'm extremely grateful that he took the time um, to chat with me. Um, and if you don't yet know me, if you're coming to this video because Alex has shared it out with his followers, my name is Arden Lee and I am the front woman and sole proprietor of my project, Arden and the Wolves. I'm also one half of the Dark Wave Industrial Dance Pop Project Prosperteen, and I am also the creator and facilitator of the Repatterning Project, which is an eight-week course in an accelerated study of human consciousness and human learning systems for the purpose of creating sustainable patterns within ourselves and within our own lives and the way that we navigate reality. So when Alex and I connected, it was cool. It was like, oh, we're both course creators. We're both in the music business. This is really great. And I really enjoyed the chat with him. <laughs> for me, it's really about like naming the pattern and um, using using this example as um, just like as a, <laughs> as a teachable moment, as it were. So what I wanna do next is I just wanna share the story of what happened to me. So you have a little bit of the background of um, what Alex and I were chatting about and then I'm gonna go ahead and share the conversation that I had with Alex and hopefully um, hopefully this contains some really good information for other artists um, and folks in the music business to learn from so um, so yeah so here we go all right so <laughs> so what happened <laughs> um, about a year ago 
um, I was connected with a music producer um, through a very loose connection, um, not someone I knew very well, but someone who, um, who was acquainted with me and acquainted with this person and basically set us up because they thought that it would be a good fit between artist and producer. And this person reached out to me, this producer reached out to me and um, wrote this really like beautiful, long, detailed, thoughtful email and asked me if I would be open to doing some kind of music like XYZ. And I, it ha so happened that I had a song that I had written that fit that genre. And I was like, actually, yes, there's something that would be a great fit for this. And it just felt like, it just felt like everything was aligning. Like, oh, cool. And at the time, you know, I had more songs than I had producers to produce them. So I was actively seeking out producers. So this really felt like a good alignment. And um, we started work on the song. And, um, and he was uh, communicative and he was, um, um, you know, great at taking feedback and everything with the song work um, was going pretty well. We got to meet up once, um, he does not live in California, but we got to meet up once um, when he was visiting Los Angeles and like we really clicked, you know, like we talked for hours. Like I really want to emphasize that this really felt like an aligned connection, you know? And we worked on the song together and sure enough, like it was coming together really nicely. And, um, and my, my, my original plan for this album that I'm working on, um, had been to basically, you know, create a bunch of different songs with, um, potentially different producers, cause I'm kind of doing a little genre hopping, um, but to pull them all together and have one producer mix the album, like, like add maybe like a day's worth of production to each song and then the, do the mix for the album. Cause it was like, I wanted it to have like a cohesive feel at the very end, you know? So, um, so after a little bit of work on the song that he and I were doing together, um, he contacted me and he was like, Hey Arden, I, I want to let you know that I'm not going to be able to produce more songs for you going forward. Right now, I don't have the bandwidth. Um, you know, he had a whole bunch of things um, in his life that were coming up that needed his attention. And um, first red flag, this wasn't a huge red flag, but it was something that I for sure noticed. He was like, I know that's not the news you were hoping for. I was like, well, I wasn't really hoping one way or another. I'm pretty good at non-attachment, thanks. <laughs> you know, like I don't want anything that's not a good fit for someone. So. I uh, appreciate the clarity, um, but he says, he says, but I'd really like to submit myself for the position of mixing the record. Um, mixing is like a different part of my headspace and I can definitely commit to that. And so I'd, I'd like to do that. And I was like, yeah, you know, I love your mixes. Like every time you sent me even like a first pass at, at the song we were doing on together, the mixes were like so solid. They were just, they were great. So again, I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, this feels aligned. A person is letting me know that he's not available to produce more songs for me, but he does want to do the mix for the record. And it so happens that I love his mixes. This seems like a great fit. Great. So I said, let's, let's hop on the phone. Let's chat about that. Let's, let's talk about like what your rates are and what that would look like going forward. So, so we went ahead and did that. And, um, and we got on the phone and he quoted me for, um, for the work I was looking for, which was, um, you know, just a, a, a sprinkle of additional production on each song, just like, just like, you know, effects and reverbs, harmonies, you know, you know, just like not, not the meat and potatoes of the song, but like the paprika, <laughs> you know, like, like the, the, the final touches to, to pull it together. Um, and the mix on top of that. And he quoted me a rate of 8,000 and I thought that was really reasonable. Um, and what I've learned is that, um, the 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 usual rate for um for a mix of a full length like it usually can be anywhere from five thousand to twenty five thousand so um so I was like wow yeah that sounds like a great rate actually and let's let's move forward so I was like I'm ready to go um you know go ahead and and send me the contract and I'll I'll look it over and and then we'll we'll move forward I was like I have you know a bunch of songs that are at, at various stages of completion and I would like to be able to like start collecting them all in one place so. Um, so, so he sends me this contract and here's red flag number two. Um, and this contract has a ton of language in it. It's like two full pages of stuff that I don't understand. And now I also recognize that I'm, you know, I'm, I am leveling up in my own music career and I am working with like more and more seasoned experienced producers. And so there's going to be that like new levels, new doubles, right? <laughs> so, so no pun intended. Um, so, so, so basically, um, I was like, 
okay, I don't understand this, but but I can learn it, right? Um, it, it did feel a little scary to me. Like, I, I totally, like, had, had a, a mini panic attack. Like, I had a mini trauma response. Like, oh my God, I don't, I'm over my head. I don't know what to do. Um, but I was like, well, this is learnable, you know? So I, I called up my mentor, um, who is sort of uh, uh, overseeing the album um, and, and advising me on it, on its creative process. And he referred me to a lawyer. So I went to the lawyer and I specifically said to the lawyer, my mentor immediately like took a look at this document and was like, there's some percentages in here that he said, he's like, this is ridiculous. He's like, I have never seen 5% royalty of, of gross income um, on like for someone who's mixing an album. And I was like, well, he is doing some additional production, but he's like, that is just ridiculous. That's, that's way too high. And I was like, all right, well, you know, look, I'm, I'm no stranger to paying a premium rate, right? I'm, I'm come from the coaching industry, you know, you know, in part. And, um, and I don't mind like paying to invest in myself. Obviously I'm making an album that's like already going to cost me like roughly around $30,000. So like, I'm not a stranger to paying money. Right. But, um, I just want to make sure everything was fair. So I went ahead and I, I hired the lawyer that my mentor referred me to and I sent the contract over and I said to the lawyer, I was like, look, I'm not interested in haggling over rates. You know, I like the guy, I'm working with him, it's going well. So please just like give me your normal review. Just like make sure that I don't do anything stupid, right? Just like, just just make sure I'm not making some big mistake or, or whatever. And uh, and the lawyer also wrote more back and was like, like, look, like this lawyer email and he's like, there are some fundamental problems with the document, you know, is, is what he says. And basically he said the same thing too. He was like, these royalties are too high. And again, I came back and I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to haggle. Like I don't want to nickel and dime on someone's rate. You know, it's fine. I'm accustomed to, to paying a premium. So basically my lawyer wrote back with, um, with some changes. Um, and I kind of briefly looked them over again. I didn't understand them entirely. Um, but I had another friend kind of help me look over them. And then I went ahead and I sent it to the producer, the potential mixing candidate. And I said, um, all right, you know, uh, I had my lawyer look it over and, um, you know, I, I understand. I was like, I don't, I don't want this to, uh, to, to create conflict. I specifically told my lawyer, like, please don't pick any fights. You know, I understand that lawyers like, just the way that human patterning works, right? If like, if someone is financially incentivized to pick fights or create conflict, like they don't even have to have a, a, a poor intention in order for that incentive to like find like, like things to, to nitpick about, right? So, and they're just doing their job, I get it, right? No shade. So, so you know, so I, I said to the producer, I was like, you know, I, I really did just ask him for his normal review. So go ahead and take a look. My hope is that everything is going to be cool and it's just going to be like clarifications and provisions for what was essentially already there. So go take a look and, and let me know and then hopefully we can go ahead and move forward. And then so a couple days go by and then he calls me at 10 p.m. on a Sunday night and he says to me, he's like, Arden, I, I can't sign this contract. This is a very, this is a very artist friendly contract to put it euphemistically. And I'm like, okay, well, um, Hey, you know, let, let's have a conversation. If there's things that my lawyer put in that you can't sign, you know, that doesn't have to be a hard line in the sand, but that can be a jumping off point for us to talk about it and talk about why, you know, you need things changed back. So let's go. Let's go ahead and, and we'll we'll have that chat. And he's like, yeah, are, are you are, you know are, are you available right now? And it's 10 p.m. on a Sunday, but I'm like, sure, <laughs> yeah, no worries, you know. And I said to him, I was like, I just took an edible, which was true. I live in California, cannabis is legal, and it, it is helpful to me at nighttime to um, for for you know regulation and sleep and, and everything. So I was like, fair warning, I just took an edible, but but yeah. And he's like, all right, baby, let's do it. I can go all night. And I was like, that's kind of gross, but okay. It was the first time that he had spoken to me that way. So tiny red flag, but I was like, all right, well, yes, we can, we can stay up this evening and we can have this conversation. So we start having this conversation and there's, there's just like, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff basically in lieu of, um, in lieu of changing the royalty, my lawyer had basically said, well, let's treat the 8,000 as an advance. So that way, when the royalties start coming in this 5% that everyone around me was saying was kind of exorbitant, you know, um, um, at the very least, like I'll get my 8,000 back before that royalty kicks in. And this makes sense to me because that's how my book deal happened. When I got a book deal, you know, you, of course the royalties have to fill up the advance before you start getting them. Like that makes sense to me. Right. And also if I get a deal with a record label, I also know that if they give me an advance for the record that I'm creating now, 
it's going to be the same thing. They're going to have to like, I'm going to get that. It's an advance, right? It's an advance on the expected royalties. So, um, so that's kind of how I was approaching it. And I was kind of like, all right, I get it. So you want to make sure that you get your flat fee, your 8,000, no matter what, in case, like, again, I've got like double digit listeners on Spotify right now, you know, like I haven't released music since like 2018. So there's nothing in my empirical past that says I'm going to blow up and be big. So of course you want your flat fee, but on the off chance that I do blow up and become big. And certainly if those of you who've been following my YouTube channel have, have been seeing how I've been directing a lot of energy toward that this year. And I've gotten a lot of weird, you know, kind of confirmations and everything that, that I don't know, stuff is moving. So I don't want to, I don't want to count my chickens before they're hatched, but, but who knows? So, so in case this does become like the next big smash hit, then, then great. You get your 5% for being a part of that back when, you know, but then I get my 8,000 and you get your royalty, right? So what's the problem? And he was very upset by this. It was very, well, no, I shouldn't have to wait for you to get paid before I start getting paid. And I'm like, why? Cause I'm literally, I'm literally paying everyone else. I'm like, I'm like, if they're, if they're, look, if it weren't for my willingness to invest roughly $30,000 in this project up front before knowing, then nobody would be making any money from it. Like I am the person who has created this. So, so, so why is it not like you're already getting paid? I'm not, why am I going to have to start paying you before I make back what I recouped paying for this album and, and taking this financial risk, you know? And, and, and I'm basically, I'm just like, I like, like, you know, like, please explain, please, you know, I, I, this doesn't make sense to me. So please understand, please explain to me like why this is, is the way that it has to be. And basically he's like, well, Arden, you're, you're not Taylor Swift. Like you're, you're not there yet. You're not, you know, whatever. So, so I, you know, you have to, and I'm just, and at this point I'm just kind of like, huh. Um, this is interesting because you, you, you definitely don't sell me <laughs> on a premium facilitation service, which is what producing is. Let's be straight about that. Um, by, by believing in me less than I believe in myself, you know, I'm like, that's an odd way to sell someone on the phone, but, um, all right. Apparently I am not yet famous enough for you to do this at a cheaper rate. Okay. <laughs> I don't understand how that makes sense, but, um, and he says to me, he's like, look, Arden, if you don't want a percentage then I'll, I'll mix the album, but it's going to be $25,000. And I was, and I actually was like, oh, 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 okay. I see now. So what you're telling me is that your usual rate for a mix is 25,000, but you're kind of doing it like for a discount for me in exchange for like, like stock in the company, right? If you can't afford the full service, you'll accept partial payment in like stock, right? Is that, is that it? Because this was actually like, that was an analogy that made sense to me. And he should have gone with that, <laughs> but instead he was like, no, that's not, um, that's not what I mean. Um, if it helps you to think of it that way, then, then sure. But no, what it is, is it's a hybrid rate. It's the 8,000 flat fee and it's the plus 5% of, of royalties of your gross income from all the recordings. And yes, I start making that like right away. Right. And I'm like, all right, well, Still sounds kind of funny to me, but let's, okay, I, I don't really get it, but let's, let's keep going. And at this point, like, you know, um, and by the way, actually at this point, we had gone like three hours on the phone about this on, on Sunday night. And then we're, we're by this point in the conversation, we're actually back on the phone again, Monday afternoon. Um, and, and it's becoming pretty clear that, that he's not happy about spending this much time on the phone with me. And I, you know, and I get it, it is a lot of time. Right. Um, and, uh, and he said, you know, he said to me at that point, look, it's not my job to educate you on the music business. That's your lawyer's job. And I said to him, I said, you know, cause I work in, I work in the coaching business. I have an $8,000 package on my website. So I said, well, yes, it's, it's not your job to educate me on the music business. That's true. Um, but if we're on a sales call together, you know, I have an $8,000 program on my website. And if someone is interested in signing up for it, I am going to take some time to jump on a discovery call with them and answer their questions about it. And now I understand that like, you know, we're go, we're going into like, you know, like hour four of this conversation. And I understand that this has gone on a long, gone on like a lot longer than you would probably like, but um, you did tell me last night when we jumped on the phone that you had all night to speak to me. And we, I also was upfront with you about the fact that I had just had an edible. So if you need to draw clearer boundaries for how much conversation you're available for, um, that's kind of on you. Um, plus my lawyer charges by the three minute increments. So, <laughs> and he did say, you know, he's like, well, well that part's true, but, but he said, you sought me out. I didn't seek you out. You don't have to, I don't want you to sign anything that you don't understand, but you sought me out. 
And that was a bald faced lie, <laughs> y'all. Like, and I said, you know, because because I know, you know, I I am I have repatterned from my trauma responses enough, you know. Um, for those of you who follow that work of mine, you know, I have repatterned from my fawn response where I just want to go along and agree with what everyone says, and I have the presence of mind to be able to say, actually, that's not true. Um, you are actually the first person to email me to pitch me doing a song and this genre together that we did. And then you specifically said that you wanted to submit yourself for the position of mixing the record. So no, I did not seek you out. You actually sought me out and I'm happy to entertain this notion, but, but let's not get it twisted here. Um, another thing I want to emphasize too is that throughout this conversation, there was also a lot of talk of like when I had questions about things in the contract where I was like, all right, well, this part protects you from X, Y, Z, um, but it doesn't protect me from this other thing happening. Like what's, why is there not a provision there for that? And his answer to a lot of this was, um, well, you just have to trust the people you're working with. And I said to him, I specifically said, I was like, um, all right, like, maybe that's true. Um, maybe it, maybe I do. And maybe this is a discernment issue, but I, let's just make this clear. What's written in the contract provides for loopholes around you being protected from XYZ. But when it comes to me being protected, you're telling me that I just have to go on trust or I have to move forward on good feelings or it has to be positive vibes with someone or I just have to trust with someone. So let's just like, let's just not get it twisted that that is actually the conversation that's happening here. And, and let's not pretend that it's otherwise, you know? And so obviously like, you know, I, I guess this was just a lot more work than he was expecting. So finally I was like, look, I understand, you know, I would be upset if um, a discovery call I was on was taking, you know, four hours too. So let's do this. Let's just go over the rest of the contract tonight. Uh, we'll go through it point by point. We'll just knock it all out. And then I'll go ahead and I'll do whatever research or have any conversations that I need to have on my end to come back to you with a definite answer. And he agreed to that. And we jumped on the phone later that night. And we spent another two hours. So it's a total of like six hours now. I get it that we're, that we're on the phone. And I get that that's a lot. And he's explaining things to me. Um, and the last point of contention was just that he was unwilling to, um, to have the, um, uh, to have the litigation be in California. He wanted it to be in his own, own home state, which was really funny because he keeps saying like, well, this is a partnership or you, you know, you have to trust the people you're working with or, or, you know, <laughs> or, 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 or why do I get this rate? Well, because I'm an artist. I don't work for a flat fee and I consider, and, and this is a partnership. Well, okay, but, but you're saying these words like partnership, but in the contract, things are, this is clearly not an equal partnership. This is clearly weighted in your favor. And any of the changes that the lawyer has made to, you know, bring it back to being somewhat equal um, are things that he's shooting down, right? So I'm just noticing this. I'm like, all right, you know, and I thought about it, you know, because here's the thing. I understand that having a, a sales process an integrated sustainable sales process is not easy because I had to learn one for my business. And when I work with people, you know, I'm literally working with like people's early childhood trauma histories many times, you know, usually. And, um, and this is obviously a, a container that needs delicate facilitation. And the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. So if you're, if you're in any way, like, like, risking re-traumatizing someone on a sales call, putting too much pressure onto them, you know, making them feel bad about themselves. Like that's just not going to work with my business. Like who is, who is going to sign up with me if that's the way I'm behaving on the phone. Right? So I had to, I went and I got business coaching. I paid a premium rate for business coaching and I went and I learned all the sales tactics. And because, you know, you know, some of you will be more familiar with this than others, but just take my word for it that a lot of the sales, scripts that are taught in the coaching community, especially in the spirituality consciousness community with all of its completely unintegrated shadow, um, actually rely a lot on um, pressuring and, and, and basically hitting on people's pain points and potentially re-traumatizing them. And I witnessed this. So not only did I spend a whole bunch of money to go learn a sales process, but I also like went through everything that I learned with a fine tooth comb and was like, how do I, okay, how do I create a script that, that accomplishes the things that I need to accomplish, but does not put any undue pressure on someone that basically acts as a good representation of how my own work functions and is going to be as supportive of people and their processes as my actual facilitation is, right? So I put a lot of 
freaking work into my sales script and I'm very happy with it. Thank you very much. Maybe one day I'll make a video about that. But basically, how are you going to come to me asking me to spend $8,000 on your services, which yes, is a very reasonable rate for mixing, but it's still, that is still a premium investment and get on the phone with me and get impatient and get emotional and, and, and get defensive and, and not be, not be able to, to back up the rate that you're quoting me, w not be able to answer my questions and not be able to justify your rate, you know, again, without getting emotional and defensive and frankly gaslighting me and saying, you sought me out, I didn't seek you out. Well, that's actually not true. And um, again, the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. So naturally, like that was the big red flag for me is that I was just like, I don't feel, there's too much conflict in the channel. Like this is not a person that I'm feeling safe around. I'm actually started wondering like, how did this happen? Like, how did this person, like, Every other producer I was working with at that time was referred to me by, by my mentor. It's the only person who wasn't connected to my mentor or to my community in Los Angeles that was just brought in by this very vague acquaintance that I didn't even know very well. And everything had seemed really aligned, but I started feeling like, like whoa, who, who, who have I let into my space? Who thinks that it's okay to talk this way to a potential client? I was insulted. Not even as an artist, because I don't care about this person's opinion of me. Oh, you're not Taylor Swift. Yeah, no shit, right? And <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> but, but I was insulted just like, how dare you come in and pitch me a business, a business offer, when you clearly have not even done the work on your business that I have done on mine, you know? And you're gonna come and charge me this, this same rate for as the same rate as a, as a package that I have on my website. And, and, and you don't know how to take a sales call and you don't know how to, how to, you know. So part of me was thinking about this and I was like, what if Arden, like, what if, what if this was just a person who didn't have a good sales process? Are you actually missing out on working with a good producer who just happens to not be very good at sales? Remember, you were also not very good at sales once yourself. I'm sure, I'm sure there's plenty of early sales calls that I've made a jackass myself on too, you know? So, so I was like, all right, well, I don't want to miss out on the premium service just because, you know, someone doesn't have a good sales process. So, um, let me just think about this for a couple days. So I went and I called my mentor. Um, my mentor was horrified um, that someone had spoken to me in this manner. Um, and, um, and then I called the other two producers that I was working with. And I just said, I was like, hey, like this is the situation. This, these are the conversations I've been having. Does this rate feel fair to you? This is what this person is pitching me. And both my producers, both of them, in the same afternoon, immediately said, are you kidding me? I will match his flat rate without the percentages. And I was just like, well, this just feels like a no brainer, you know? So I ended up bringing on um, both the producers that I'd been working with already on a couple of different songs individually and basically said, all right, you know, the, the four of us, my mentor, me, my mentor as sort of creative director and the two producers I've been working with, we will finish out this album together. Anything that the four of us cannot accomplish, we will find some of, someone will know someone to outsource it to and this is how we will get this done together. So I secured my team and I called back the other producer and I basically said, I was like, all right, um, um, yeah, so I went and had some conversations and hey, it's nothing personal. I, you know, I, I really do like your work, um, but uh, I've just got too many people telling me not to sign this. So obviously I asked them for a reason. I'm not gonna just, I'm not gonna hire a lawyer and then, you know, do the other thing I was gonna do anyway. So I'm sorry, I just can't say, I can't, I can't say yes. Um, so thanks anyway, but, but I'm gonna have to pass. And, uh, and he was cool with it. He was like, all right, well, you know, I, I really do genuinely like wish you luck and everything. And I did pay him for his six hours of the discovery call that we took together. Cause I understand that he's, you know, it wasn't his job to educate me on the music business and it was very educational. I certainly learned a lot. So I ended up paying him voluntarily. I paid him his day rate just so we could be, you know, nice and clean and that could be all all settled um and um and i signed a contract with him to um just for the work that we did on this one song together even then i had to come back and, and call him out and say excuse me i already told you that this legal proceeding mandate needs to be for the state of california not your own home state again so much for a partnership right um and uh he did end up changing that and um and we kept his 
we kept his 5% rate for that one song because again, I don't believe in haggling on people's rates. And if that's a premium rate for this song, then fine, you know, have it for that one song or whatever. But if, if someone is, if I feel like someone is not having a good faith conversation with me, then I'm not, I'm not going to hire them for more work, obviously. So we settled everything finally. And I, I, I confirmed my team here in Los Angeles and I'm feeling really good about moving forward. Um, so that is the thing that happened. But what I'm really much more interested in is um, the that when I shared this story, there were many people on that filtered post who commented on it, many artists and producers who who understand the music business and who came on that post and said, yes, this was messed up. And this is endemic of a larger pattern that we have seen other places because artists are often so willing to go so far for their music that there are people out there who are willing to, to take advantage of them basically. And, um, and so that, um, that is the main thing that I want to chat about. So that's the story that happened to me that led to this conversation with Alex. And I was super grateful that Alex agreed to do a Zoom call with me um, and specifically to tape it for my channel um, because Alex is also someone who's really passionate about like making sure that artists are equipped and informed with, with as much information as possible to, to navigate this industry that, that apparently at times can can be rather predatory. So, um, so yeah, so, so that's the story. Um, I'm excited to now share this conversation that I had with Alex. So, um, so yeah, so go ahead and check it out and, um, and let me know what you think. Basically like what, what you're saying in here is, um, like a 5% royalty for pretty much just mixing a record is not like, it's just, yeah, for like for straight up mixing, there's, there's no percentage that you give uh, to the mixer. He wouldn't get a percentage for the mixing. He would get a percentage for that small amount of producing, but it would never, I mean, even if, I mean, even though, even if the producers just straight up basically wrote all the music and did all, uh, and performed it all, uh, well, like they wouldn't get 5% for their like producing fee or production fee. They'd get percentages on other things. Like they'd get percentage as a performer. They'd get percentage as a songwriter. Uh, they wouldn't get like 5%, you know, overall because of because they like did some uh producing right the the highest produ uh points i've ever seen a producer get on any record and this is like a multi-platinum producer was 2.2 percent right wow. so you know obviously different producers and people have different ways they go about it uh sometimes they they don't actually have a one of the ways they like i guess entice artists is that they uh they tell them all right you don't have to pay me any upfront fee it just percent this percentage um, and usually it's a pretty high percentage. Um, but, uh, it's, it depends, like I said, on the producer, but usually that percentage is just a distraction, uh, because they're, they expect the artist to be like, okay, um, I, I don't feel good about giving up that kind of percentage, uh, uh or ownership or whatever on my music. Uh, can we work something else out? Right. So, yeah, usually it's just a kind of like a way for them to create a scenario where like, okay, we're compromising, right? When actually in actuality, that was never a compromise. It was just like an additional step they put in there. So they come off as like, oh, all right, I'm going to compromise because you're like a fresh artist. Let's try to make it. And I dig what you're doing, you know, kind of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, so usually it'll be like, uh, all right, instead of taking whatever percentage, how about uh, we work out some kind of payment pa uh, plan and it'll be usually in the tens of thousands, uh, upward of 20,000 usually. Uh, and that's usually for a song, I might add. That's oh, not wow. even for, yeah, that, like the, the, the last person that this happened to that uh, was telling me about uh, her um, uh, experience, it was for one song. And this, this producer, this producer is like a relatively well, relatively well known. He's worked on some big stuff, um, well, uh, but like not recently. But so it was one of those things where you know he was like, "Yeah, we could do this. Uh, uh, you know, we could. We'll work on this song. Well, you can come to my studio. You don't have to pay for any of the studio time or or whatever. We'll do this one song. It'll cost you like." I think it was like 15,000 or something like that for that one song. Wow. And, and you can just pay me over, you can just pay me this amount 
each month for however many years. Uh, she's she's either still paying it off to this day, or she is like just finished or is about to finish with it. It's been like years. She's, wow. been, she's been paying it off. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I I guess she felt that was worth it though. Like, was she happy with the end product? No. No. Okay. That's it, it was, the, that's a big problem then. Yeah. It was. Yeah, the, the song itself she was happy with, but he pretty much did nothing that he promised other than record the song and make it sound like a professional product, which is, I mean, you know, that that, that was part of the deal, but for that one song, the amount she paid, it was actually mostly for the entire marketing side and pushing it to, to like um, the people that he knows to try and see what she can land on, you know, in terms of either label deals or or whatever, really. Um, and none of that happened. He, he would just keep saying, uh, uh, people just are not vibing with it. Um, you know, there's nothing nothing I can do, but there's like, there was never ever any evidence he actually even tried. Like every time she would be like, oh, you know, like, can I like talk to them? Maybe like uh, give them my story and stuff like that. And he'd be like, no, like they, they they're just not interest, interested at all. You know, and the way he would would word it would make her feel like she was like really deficient in some way as a musician or as an artist when nothing could be further from the truth. She was incredibly talented. One of the most talented musicians I've ever worked with. Um, her songwriting is great. Her lyrics are great. Her performance is unbelievable. Um, yeah, nothing could be further from the truth. But the way this guy framed it, uh, to her was like, yeah, sorry, you just don't have what it takes, basically. Um, yeah, tell tell me more about that because something that that I encountered in this phone call was like, you know, and and again, I I realized that like where where I'm at as an artist, like I don't have the numbers. You know, I'm confident in my right. abilities, but my numbers, like you know, my like I said, my Spotify listeners are like in the double digits right now because sure. all I've ever created are self-released, you know, and, and my last EP was like when I first started actually putting money into publicity. So, so I get like, I, I get why I'm there, but I'm obviously like working toward, you know, a, a, a bigger audience. So, yeah. and one of the things this guy kept saying to me was like, well, you're not Taylor Swift. You're not, if you, if you were, then this would be a different rate. And I'm like, you like you don't sell to me by making me feel bad about myself like what like what is right. what is up with what do you think it's up with that pattern like do you think it's just something that do you think a lot of producers have like like is this something that they're passing down this, or yeah like this is this is something artists that, is just like <laughs> that specific pattern has been going on i mean i get probably probably since the beginning of like the record industry I, I don't know how it started. I don't know why. And I don't know why people continue doing it. I mean, it's one of those things that people, I guess maybe they do because that's just the way it's always been done. That's kind of what I was thinking too. It's almost like, um, you know, because what I do in my work is helping people like break out of, break out of patterns that they've learned other places. And oftentimes it's right. like, it's like in people's families, right? But it can be in an industry too. Like if you've worked with someone, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and I know this person had, had once been an artist, you know, years ago. So I'm sure that they were on the receiving <laughs> end of a lot of that yeah. kind of treatment. And it's just like, we just pass this down mindlessly without thinking about what we're doing to one another. And it's, it was just like, it was, it was almost like to the point where my outsiders, like my feeling of being an outsider in the industry, it almost felt like an advantage where I was just like, like, I don't like, I don't under, I don't understand this. <laughs> you know, like, how does this, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's funny because uh... like in the, in the coaching world, like, like our, like the, the predatory tactics in the coaching world are like, they're actually like in a weird way, they're different. They're like, they're, they're basically like a coach who wants to spend, wants you to spend a whole bunch of money on a big, like transformational package with them is actually going to say like, you're better than this. Why are you playing small? Like you need to step up. You need to take inspired right. action. Like what is it costing you not to take action on this? What is it costing you not to right. move forward? And the funny thing is like, if you got me on the phone and you were like, like, if you were, if you were, 
were like, Arden, what is it costing you not to take your band seriously? Like, look how many years you've been making music and yet you, you haven't, you know, 100% committed to this. Like, are you ready to really right. put yourself behind this? I'd have been like, yes, sign me up. Like, I, I probably would have paid it. You know what I mean? Right. Well, yeah. So that, that, that person that you were working with, I would say is an outlier because usually that is how it works. Mm. Uh, usually most of these producers... Uh, I mean, it's, it's, and, and, to, and to be fair, it's not really like predatory, like producers that are, ju are just doing this. I mean, it's true. Like if you actually are going to take something seriously, you have to make a serious investment in that. Right. And that usually involves time and money. Right. Those are the two most serious investments you can make really in, in anything you can do. Right. Uh, so, yeah, but obviously when, you know, uh, uh, producers, usually the predatory producers, at least. Um, they kind of like use that to their advantage because they have also, Hey, I have, you came to me, you've heard, you've heard, you've seen what my credits are. You maybe you've even like worked with me a little bit and you like what I do. Um, so they kind of use all that to like, to their advantage. And the person you worked with, um, I would say is an outlier because he did the opposite, which is weird. It's, I've never heard somebody like try and play the, yeah, try to do just yeah to try and put the artist down into into believing that they have to do this because not not for, I guess yeah, I'm not sure not like I'm not sure what his yet. strategy like, was. Not famous enough yeah. to be worth a cheaper rate, <laughs> which, I'm like... Wait, which is which is <laughs> mind blowing because uh, when you're really famous, you're getting screwed left and you're getting screwed more than when you're not famous for the most yeah. part. Um, like he brought up that example with. Taylor Swift, she got like really screwed until recently. She actually just won a court. I don't know if you are uh, aware, but she just won a court case uh, where she basically could. She didn't really get the rights back to her music, but um, she re-recorded them. The right? press. Yes. Yeah, so, so the precedent she set was that uh, she completely re-recorded the album uh, and she has 100% rights to every, uh, everything on that album now. She has, because uh, she paid for it all herself, right? So she has all the mechanical rights. She has all the songwriting rights. Um, I don't know about publishing. Did she publish it with somebody or did she self-publish? I'm not either sure. Either way, like, yeah. 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 I, I, either way, um, she, that set a precedent because now any band that, or any artist sufficiently big enough can just do that. And and no label or anyone who owns that that like previous version of the album would ever want that because you just completely dilute like yeah like you completely cut off at least half of the the uh, income stream that they were getting from that first album. So yeah. and they tried really hard to fight her on that, but they but they failed. Yeah. So and that's a good, and it's, it's a great win for <laughs> artists. Yeah, it's a great win for artists. Um, but re in reality, um. No producer working with a up and coming artist ever expects to receive any royalty from that music's streaming or playing. I mean, it's, it, I mean, everybody wants like you know, oh yeah, my, my song is it's great and and it, I think it'll be a big hit and stuff like that. It's possible, uh, but it's unlikely. Um, and any producer who's gotten far enough, at least. That if you're to, to uh, for you to have to know them and work with them, most likely knows this. Uh, so the the really the the main reason why that percentage exists is a kind of like a um, first step distraction in the uh, negotiating process with you. Um, so that five percent, uh, well, it's a little bit different in in your case, but usually uh, when they give you that percentage. Uh, they'll be like, oh, uh, the artist will usually like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to give up like that much percentage. And usually that's on top of like a fee and, you know, like some uh, songwriting rights and percentages and uh, performance. Oh, yeah, there were those too. <laughs> oh, there was, yeah, there yeah, was yeah. all so, that in the contract for sure. There was, yeah. there was the performance okay. royalties. There was also, um, um, sorry, what were, you, what were you just said? There was, yeah, there was a flat fee. There was the flat right. fee to mix the record and then 5% on top of that over the whole thing. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so usually that 5% fee is just like, uh, is it's expected that you're going to take a, a issue with that because you're, that's a lot. 
you're giving up a lot for that. And so there's uh, at, at that point, most reasonable people um, will start questioning this deal and like, hey, I don't know about this percentage. And uh, it was different in your case, but usually when you bring up that issue with the fi- with the with the percentage, the producer will then go, okay, well, how about we do uh, a flat fee? Like we just do a, 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 a like a flat fee for the pr- producing, but it's like twenty five thousand, like in the example of your guy. Right? Yeah, and- that's that's exactly what he did. He was like, if you don't want to pay the percentage. Then, uh, right. then we can get rid of the percentage, but then it's 25,000 to mix the record. And I, I right. wonder, like, he, he didn't push that, you know, he wasn't like, oh, it's okay, we can come up with a payment plan, because I was just immediately like, right. the, the funny thing was, like, my re- response to that was like, oh, so what you're saying is, it's normally 25,000 for you to mix the record. And I understand, I know producers who charge 25,000. So that was like, oh, I get yeah, it. 20, so 25,000 is... Yeah, it's on it's on the upper. I would say that's near the upper like levels of what you know a producer could charge or for mixing. I guess mostly um, uh, for mixing. I I know a few people that charge that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I do too. Like I'm I'm friends with someone who does. You know, but I know <laughs> that I can't afford. It was like if I was going to spend twenty five thousand dollars on mixing records, then I I'd be working with my friends here in L A. <laughs> you know, right. But right, yeah, yeah. It, it, and and the funny thing is like he didn't push that because I, I hear what you're saying is you're like usually a producer will say like oh it's okay you can make a payment plan for it you know and I'm yeah like, that's usually what it yeah. that's that's it's usually a um like a uh, what's it, oh, like a faint is that the right word to use uh so that it kind of like throw like kind of distracts you from what their actual goal was all along was to get you to agree to this exorbitant fee. And they don't expect any new artists to be able to pay it up front. I mean, sometimes it happens, but it's very unlikely. Um, so yeah, they get you on a payment plan and you know, you get enough people um, on a payment plan with you like that. That's a decent chunk of change, you know? Uh, so that, that's where that guy, I, I don't know. Yeah. Usually, like I said, that's what they do. They do a payment plan thing, but the guy you were working with for some reason missed the memo. I'm not sure what his, uh, plan was exactly yeah. well, it's um, funny because when he said that like you know he, he didn't he, he didn't offer a payment plan right away but basically like i i was then like oh so what you're saying is twenty five thousand is your normal fee and you're offering right. me a discount with the percentage and i was like so so what you're mm-hmm. saying is it's almost it's like i can't afford your fee but you'll accept partial payment with like stock in the company essentially right. and this like i actually right. understood that i was like okay so i'm sure. actually getting yeah. a twenty five thousand dollar mix and, right. and you're giving and he's like and i was like and, and so i was like is that is that is that what it is and he's like no that's not what it yeah, is yeah yeah that, that's because that, like, that, if, if that's what it was he would have said that in the beginning <laughs> yeah right? yeah so <laughs> that, I was that, like, that definitely that definitely like, and, and it would have been a red that, flag. That, made, that actually makes yeah. sense to me, you know. Yeah. But this this yeah, weird... that, that could have worked. That that could have made sense. Yes. Yeah, and and he's like, no, it's just it's a hybrid rate, and I'm like, I don't, I don't, but I don't understand. And and everyone, you know, my my lawyer was basically like, no, like this is this is not normal. There there are fundamental problems with this document, is what my lawyer's email said. And then. Yeah. On top of Very that, you know, like, like I said, I went to the other pro- two producers I'm working with and I was like, does this sound normal to you? And they were like, no, this is, and they were like, both of them were like, I'll mix the record for the flat. I'll match the flat fee without the percentage. And I was just like, yeah. oh, well <laughs> done, <laughs> you yeah. know? Yeah. It's uh, I, yeah. And that, that would be fair. I would say, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I mean, for, for, are, are they, you said they're doing producing too. Are they getting like any like uh other points on the record or anything like that yeah they're definitely going to be getting points they were both referred to me by my mentor so so essentially what we all agreed to is we're all going to sit down and my mentor is basically going to figure out based on who's done all like what work on this record what is fair so sure and i'm cool with that too because i want people to be sharing in in the work like i just want it to be for sure Yeah, yeah yeah Yeah, exactly. You want it to be fair. Uh, this this person was not negotiating in good faith and was not trying to be fair. Yeah. Uh, at least yeah. in my opinion, based on everything I've heard. It uh, certainly so felt that way from how emotional he got. About it. Yeah, like, like, like he got that emotional. Like, uh, so here's the thing. You said this person used to be an artist. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, like back in the day, there weren't someone that I had heard so, of. 
this is something I've noticed is that uh, people who, I mean, how do I say this nicely? Didn't make it uh, as artists, uh, but like ended up going into producing and stuff like that. I've noticed that those people tend to be especially difficult when dealing with artists when as producers. It's like it's like oh. some kind of like it's it's like they're like some kind of um what's the word stage mom uh, <laughs> yeah it's like it, it, well it's it's like um no it's it's like they're kind of like just angry with the industry that they didn't end up like being like the rock star or whatever that they wanted to be and, and I don't know it's maybe it's 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 like almost as if it's their way at getting back at the industry I have no idea what it is but I I've seen I've seen there's people that I've worked with that are that have like a similar mindset and yeah they like were an artist originally and they just they never they their band or mute as or as a solo artist they just never made it and they kind of like went into like producing as a you know compromise so they could still work in music and wow. they've been bitter about it ever since and yeah i i, I i'm not sure what the reasoning is but it's just something that i've noticed uh, and it kind of remind this person, this guy that you were we were working with, kind of reminds me of that. Yeah. So, so thank you for that. <laughs> thank you for that yeah, validation. Yeah. By the way, oh. just in general, what would you say are some things that artists should look out for in the industry that you feel maybe like? I I understand like it's hard to find a standard rate, and like you said, like what yeah. like if 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 someone's work is worth it to you, then, right. then you pay, if, if you feel comfortable paying it, then, then pay it. But yeah. in general, what would you say are some of the red flags to look out for, for producers who are specifically coming at artists with that, that either that bitterness that you mentioned or that sort of right. like, what can I get from this person in that, in that, that way that, that really isn't fair. Like what should artists especially look out for? Okay, so I actually mentioned this in your post, and we haven't talked about it yet, and it's a it's a pretty big one. Um, so just because um, somebody has, so you 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 usually when somebody goes to like a specific producer, it's because that producer worked on something that they liked, right? Um, uh, uh, so I would that that would be like the first thing to that you really want to look into and be careful about because they might not have necessarily actually done the work on that thing that you love um, because it's possible to get like credits and points on something, even though you, in the end, it didn't necessarily didn't get used at all. Um, that is much more common, much more common than anyone I think would realize. Uh, so it's possible that this producer, you know, the, your favorite song they ever worked on it's it's possible they were they were definitely involved at some point, right? And when they were involved, they made a they made a contract, and the contract says, uh, you know, I, I get this this and that, and I gotta get and I have to be credited, uh, you know, um, as the producer or whatever. And it's it's possible, and usually this happens when when you're on a, on a label. The label will you know you will you work on the music. The label listens to it, and they're like, I don't. I don't know, not, not into this. Uh, let's, let's find something else or someone else or whatever. Right. So they get somebody else to work on the song and rework it and do whatever. And then they end up going with that version of the song. That original producer still gets credit because the contract says that he gets credit. Um, and technically he does own, he does need some credit because you don't know how much that his work got affected, right. The, the, the total outcome, like we're saying earlier. Um, but you don't know that looking at the credits on the album, yeah. all it says produced by this guy. And so usually like make sure the producer that you think you like actually did the work. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, there's no really surefire way to, to know for sure, unless they tell you. Um, but, uh, one like kind of like dead giveaway, um, that I always tell people that they can, uh, look at is if on that record, it says additional mixing or additional producing or additional, whatever, that generally means that person is the one who actually did the work that you heard. But because the contract was written such, uh, they couldn't be credited as the main one. So additional it is. Um, wow. So that's, so, yeah. Yeah. So like the, the main way uh, to really see if you actually do want to work with this person is ask them to send you the most recent thing, like the most recent, like two or three things that they've done, regardless of it's a big artist or small artist. Right. Nice. Uh, and uh 
and listen to it. Does that sound like maybe what you're into and what you want? Uh, because it's very possible that it won't be. And if it isn't, oh, then maybe this is not the right producer for you. So, nice. so there's that, right? Another yeah. thing is a lot of people, um, it's, it's, it's like extremes in the music industry. They either spend way too little money and way too little effort on the production side of things, or they want to go all out and get like the best of the best and spend all their like life earnings uh, on it. So both are bad. Um, yeah. Uh, so the reason why, like you could, if you say you did uh, like find like your absolute favorite producer and you, and you straight, you maybe you even have the money straight up to just pay for it. Right. Um, you're probably, this is going to depend uh, from person to person, but you're, pro you're probably not developed enough as a musician to actually make use of this person's skill set. Right. Um, right. This, this, so if you're going to a person that works with like very experienced professional musicians that have been making records for years, know what they're doing. That's what that person is going to be used to working with. What is a sign for you that it's not a fair deal to the artist or that the artist should not be working with this person? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, unless they're producing, they shouldn't, they basically shouldn't be getting any percentage, uh, on like, uh, on, on the revenue of the album, total album. Right. Uh, and if they are producing, it's very unlikely that, that what they're doing is worth more than 2%. Uh, like I said, I know some of the biggest multi-platinum producers in the world have worked on records that everyone's heard on the radio multiple times. And the most, the, the one that I know that got more than 2%, it was 2.2. You know, so take that, take that, you know, information with you in any deal you do with a producer. Generally, 1% is probably like, a, a, it's, it's what most producers would expect. And it's generally what is like, I guess the standard is 1%. Um, you know, and that's, you know, if you do songwriting with them or whatever, that's different. That's a different percentage. You can work that out with them differently. Uh so uh, another another thing is yeah. So if they like what happened to you, they throw like a percentage at you, like especially one that's that high for something that's not even producing. Uh, that's I personally would just stop the conversation right there because this is a person that is not does not have like is not negotiating with me in good faith. Uh, I I just I don't see any way how that some that a producer can tell that to an artist. And it be, you know, a fair in their mind how that turns out to be a fair deal. Um, so there's that. Yeah. Um, Thank you for that, by the way. Yeah. Because uh, oh, yeah. I, I kind of I, feel, I like I was feeling that too. I was like this. Well, to me, it just felt strange that it didn't. I couldn't recall it having coming up, having come up in the conversation before. Mm -hmm. So when there was this random percentage there, I was like, what what is this? And then everyone else was telling me this is too much. This is exorbitant. And I'm like, hey, hey, dude everyone is saying that I shouldn't do this. And that's when he got really defensive about it and was like, well, you're not Taylor Swift. And I was like, yeah, no shit. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> you know? and you're not working with Taylor Swift. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, like, yeah, I'm like I don't know, I, that, that really, that, that point, like, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. It's, it's really confusing what that person was trying to do. I, yeah, but, it did uh, not feel like a confident sales call. I'll say that much yeah. <laughs> as, as someone who yeah. has had to learn how to make confident sales calls in like a non sleazy manner, like, yeah. a like just having a real smooth enrollment process, being able to ask, answer questions, being able to justify what my rates are like this yeah, is, without getting this defensive, like, place. Like he, like, yeah, I mean, and some of the stuff you were saying, he, he started like, it's like, I'm an artist and I'm like, okay, I guess I don't think anyone's, you know, denying that, but what does that have to do with any of this? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, like uh, the, why are you bringing, like, he's just bringing all these things into the conversation that like, what that's okay. Yeah. Like, that or all these non-answers, like, just, yeah. like, you just have to trust the people you're working with. Yeah. Like, there's that like, too. That for me was a big, I'm like, where, where in the contract does it provide for what happens if right. X, Y, Z and his answer being like, well, you just have to trust the people you're working with. Excuse so me. The only time that the only time that that phrase works from a producer is if you're actually talking about the music itself. Yeah. Like, like, Hey, no, trust me. Like we're doing this. Like I'm, I'm saying we should do this change in the song because in my experience, X, Y, Z. Right. So right. 
yeah, that's where the trust needs to, that's a, that's a, yeah, that's where the trust really needs to, to, to be between you and the producer. Like if, if you're not willing to trust the producer in, in that regard, then you probably shouldn't be working with a producer. Um, yeah, that's because, fair. yeah. Cause you know, you're, that's the whole point is that they're there to help you with their experience to try and reach the goal that you had or have with your music. Right. Um, they're kind of like the map, right? right. You're, you, you, uh, you have to take the journey, uh, but they're, they're kind of the map that will help guide you to how to get to your destination. That's the, yeah. that's the way I like to describe it. And you have so. to trust them to also like, like basically like facilitate for you, which also means holding yeah. emotional space. So if someone is ever at any point trying to make you feel bad about yourself, and that's just like the start of your relationship. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, that's a, uh, I mean, yeah, part of a producer's job is to make sure that the artist uh, feels inspired and uh, feels really good about what they're doing. And at any point, if the energy gets, what's the word? Um, Too much sour? conflict in the channel. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, then, then you're doing a bad job as a producer. Like, uh, also, if like this is a fairly common thing with very new bands and new, uh, mostly where they'll come into the studio not ready or anything like that, and they think they're like, oh, we should get a producer because that's what you do, but they actually were never ready for a producer. Uh, but if you as a producer aren't doing everything you can to make the band feel good about everything they're doing. And if you're like, if you're, if you have conflicts with them as much as they're having conflicts with each other, the band or, or the group or whatever is probably going to break up before they even finish that album with you, which I've seen happen more times than I can count. So uh, yeah, this being a producer, isn't just about working on music. It's about you're working with somebody to make art and art is more than just the physical act of of creating it, right? Right. So. Yeah. I have fired producers before because their their ability to their their they 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 lacked the ability to um criticize me in a way that lifted me up rather than put me down. And I was just like, yeah. why am I why am I it's paying? Constructive criticism. Way? It's it's the like one of the main things you have to learn as a producer. If you're if you're gonna charge money for your services, you have to be able to hold emotional space for someone. Yeah, and you have you have to know what your own like. And I, I I'm not a music producer, but I'm a facilitator, right? right. So it's right. like I need to be able to hold. And I work with people through like, you know, you know, really really vast personal transformation of of you know their PTSD responses, you know, their relationships to things like early trauma, and 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 so it's it's delicate, yeah. you know, and you have to be able to like hold space for someone to help them feel emotionally safe with you to yeah. be able to make those changes. And, and 100%. a music producer is really like, in my opinion, anyway, it, it shouldn't be any different. I've walked away from like a $1,700 deposit, you know, because mm -hmm. I was like, forget it. It's not worth the other half for right. me to finish this song with you. I'm miserable. I don't want to be there. You know, yeah. I'm like, I could all just walk away. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's a, uh, uh, I mean, that, that, that would be a red flag for working with a producer. If the producer, you, you as the artist are the one with the vision and the producer is the one that is supposed to help you achieve that vision. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, that's another thing with producers that they'll, and that's usually the easy way out for the producer. It's like, I'll just do what I know and how I work uh, because that'll be the quickest and easiest way for me to finish this and do this um, with the least amount of effort. Right. So, because uh, actually, you know, learning what the vision is the artist has and trying to help them achieve that is uh work <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly you have to uh, actually like time. get your hands dirty <laughs> yeah yeah so there's there's that too yeah. so thank you so much for having this conversation with me today and i'm really My really pleasure. grateful to be able to get your expertise also out there to other people who may be kind of following this this <laughs> this story or this channel or, or whatever and um because yeah i think it's you know i think it's super important when when you know like I know for me as an artist, I care so much about being able to, you know, to, to put the legwork under my dreams and have yeah. this happen for me. And it's like, yeah, it's easy to get waylaid and it's easy to get gaslit and, and make, have people who, who, who basically come and say like, oh, you need me more than I need you or, or whatever. Yeah. And it's easy to get lost in that. Yeah, no. And, and thank you for having me on as, uh, because this is something that I've seen more times than I uh, wish that I have happen 
And like I said, usually it's actually wor worse uh, than what you experience. Fortunately for you, it wasn't as as bad. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is this is great because this is a, a way for me to put it out there. So hopefully, other people you know, have a, maybe a, they're a little more prepared if they're going to work with a producer. You know, uh, working with the producers is is super important. You should, most likely you sh you need a producer. It's just you, be, you have to be careful. So you create really amazing courses about music production, and you're also working on a course about the music business, which is super relevant to our conversation. So if yes. people want to be able to find you, because you also you offer work as a producer. Although I understand you're in in pretty high demand now, so so it's not a guarantee. You're not necessarily right. just for hire, but right. for the right person, you you know you do production work, right? And you also um, you also um, create software for music producers, and you also create courses for artists and producers who are in the business. So where can people right. find all of your work? Okay, so my my main uh, website where I have my software and my courses is spectrodigital.com. Uh, you'll find not just my courses on there. Uh, it's my core. Uh, I'll have my courses on there and other friends in the industry that I've made over the years that I trust and are really awesome at what they do. Um, so you'll find me there on that. And then in terms of like the bands I work with and produce my personally, my main band that I, um, play in and tour with is uh, Witherfall. Uh, we're on century media, melodic metal band. Uh, if I had to like describe what kind of music we play. Um, and, uh, the main band that I currently am managing and producing is Helion prime. Uh, those guys are, are awesome. And girl, uh, Mary's yes. <laughs> Mary's I took a really voice lesson with Mary. She's incredible. She's yeah. so great. <laughs> I, I've known Mary for a very long time. She's the one who actually brought me on, on board uh, to Helium Prime. She asked, hey, would you be interested? And and I just loved everybody in the band. They're all awesome people. Uh, the music's great. Uh, and I was like, yeah, working with Mary and the rest of the band, no brainer. Uh, so that's kind of like what I'm doing musically these days. And yeah, and with the, with the courses, actually the main reason why I start, I really started doing a lot of these courses is because a lot of people wanted to work with me, especially on the business side of things, like as a manager or something, or even as a producer. But uh, I just, there's just not enough time. Uh, so the idea was like, okay, well, especially the, the business side of things, because it's just so messy and nobody really knows what they're doing because there isn't really that much information out there on it. So my idea is, like, okay, I'm going to make some music business courses, you know, it's going to be a little general because there's a lot of different situations, especially around the world. Um, but overall, where can they sign up for your mailing list so they, they that folks can hear it um, as, as soon as it comes out? So, yeah, you just go on spectrodigital.com and uh, you can there's like a uh, sign up for a newsletter thing there. Or you could just literally make an account and it, you're signed up to the newsletter that way, uh, either or. And mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, you'll get any information on any uh, courses we release. We have all kinds of courses, not just. Uh, production courses there's also like hey if you want to learn blues guitar my 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 buddy henning Polly, another awesome youtuber uh teaches a blues guitar course um we have production courses yeah all kinds of stuff it's cool awesome well thank you so much for your time today this was really incredible i'm, Welcome. Just, I'm super grateful and and thanks yeah, thank like you. let's let's stay in touch let's hang out <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, i would love to yeah yeah i'm really i'm really stoked to be connected with you thank you again yeah you're welcome all right, everyone. So that was my chat with Alex Nasla. I'll just say like for me, for from, you know, obviously I don't have the same um, experience uh, in the music industry as Alex does. Um, but I will say from my perspective, um, from my own experience in repatterning and in understanding um, um, our trauma responses or the ways that our, our bodies might react to tactics of intimidation or gaslighting. Music production really, at the end of the day, it really is facilitation. You know, um, it is, it is uh, a, a birthing process. It is a music producer is essentially, you know, it's a song doula, <laughs> right? Um, an art doula. So what I wanna say about that is that um, you don't ever have to work with someone who makes you feel bad. That's what I want to really drive home, you guys, is like, you're an artist, if you're an artist, anytime you are paying for any facilitation, whether you're an artist or whether you're someone who's watching my channel because you also 
um, um, are in personal development and you're thinking of paying for spiritual facilitation, whatever that is, I just want to remind you guys, like you are the client, you are the fucking client. I'm sorry. And you are paying someone to provide a service for you. They're not auditioning you. They may want to feel like they are. They may want to convince you that you are, you know, oh, well, I'll see if you're good enough for me. And sure, there are certain producers who are in demand and who don't have a lot of time and might choose, you know, might be selective about the people that they take on. But don't ever, please, please don't ever allow that to become an excuse for you to, to pay someone to talk like that to you, you know? Um, when you see those red flags, draw those lines in the sand and say, mm, this is not how this goes down. This is, I'm not okay with this. You know, be okay with drawing your clear boundaries. And if you have to practice, you know, with a friend or, or whatever, have practice conversations when stuff like that comes up and then, then do that, you know, because it's scary. Trust me, every pattern from a fawn response is terrifying, you know? Um, the way we do one thing is the way we do everything. So if someone is approaching you in a way that is attempting to belittle you or to make you feel small, or to make you feel bad about yourself or make you feel like you need them more than they need you, just remember at the end of the day, you're paying them. And, and there, is no, there is no room um, for gaslighting, manipulation, or, or belittling in a facilitation. There's no fucking room for gaslighting, manipulation, or belittling in a facilitation container. And I don't care if that's the, the actual container or that's when you're going to lunch afterwards or if that's on a sales call, you know, whatever it is, you deserve whether it's facilitation or just your friendships and relationships, you deserve people who treat you with respect, just bar none. And if you're an artist, the fact that you're an artist and you're trying to make it in a very competitive industry is not an excuse for someone to talk down to you. So that's what I got. So I'm really super grateful to Alex uh, for having that conversation. Super grateful to all those who've been supportive of me. Super grateful to you guys for watching this. Um, hopefully this is helpful. So, um, Whew. <laughs> one down and um, many more to go, I'm sure. So stay tuned. Thanks, you guys, and I will see you next time.